in structure, what, one of the basic observations we use in, in structure are constructing geometry. And we do that by looking at an analysis of what you might call rock body. Uh, in introductory class, you learned all about how to recognize rocks and all this kind of stuff. You've all done this kind of stuff, including dealing with things like sequences of events. Sequences of events cannot be underestimated how they are important they are in the context of structure because they allow you to reconstruct, we talked about kinematics, how, what the history of the motions that occurred over a given time. Uh, in structure, we look at the geometry of those rock bodies which are produced by characteristic association. And we deduce sort of how they started off and how they end up. And that's the key to understanding the structure is an assumption of about a beginning condition. Uh, it's important to realize, that we, we talked about last time, that that's a three or even four dimensional problem. Uh, and that's why I gave you that silly little exam. Uh, but the point is, you got to really think about three dimensional issues when you deal with things in this class. But the scale of that problem also ranges over a huge range of scales, from something at submicroscopic level to things that are sort of fuller scale. So that's the kind of things we have to deal with. I define a rock body. You don't have to write this down because you'll get this fast. But uh, it's just a volume of rock which can be distinguished from adjacent rock. That's a really vague definition. But by some characteristic, some physical characteristic. It might be mineralogy, might be color, might be texture. Here you have to unlearn what you learned in mineralogy and most of field work and in structural geology. Color does matter. Uh, because uh, <laughs> you need to be able to differentiate things, and that's usually in the You've heard Goodell's lecture, huh? Oh, I, yeah. I know about white mineral quizzes. You know. <laughs> uh, we've all been through those, right? <laughs> uh, the key in this, though, is to be able to recognize the inherent shapes or predictable shapes of primary features. If you don't know how they started out, there's no way you can predict, or you see something in a deformed state, you'll have no idea how it got that way if you didn't know how it started. Uh, and in structure, we look at secondary, we, aren't, we don't care that much about how those primary features form, other than to use them in other ways. And in structure, we study secondary structures that dis, di, distort or change that original primary architecture of the rock mass. So in SEDS, we always say that SEDS and structure are intimately linked together because you understand the primary structure from understanding depositional environments. And then you have to use that to, to understand structure as you go move to the scale when they get to form. Uh, so you can't do stratigraphy without structure, and you can't do structure without stratigraphy in many particular cases in most of those we go on. So what, well, what do I mean about primary geologic features in, in the context that we're going to be working with? Uh, and so I always say, let's be Huttonian or whatever, and think about present and repeated past, and to look at the surface of the earth. Now, this is harder in El Paso. If I used to live in New Orleans, it was easier for people to picture a very flat surface, right? <laughs> but, oh, that's, you can't see that. That's supposed to be a picture of the beach. Maybe I should turn the, the lights off. But it's good <laughs> for now. Uh, a beach is a good illustration of that sedimentary environment the sedimentary rocks are typically deposited uh, on a very flat surface. Uh, they might be deposited on upland, but most of those are never just uh, preserved in the geologic record, or, or only partially preserved, preserved in the geologic record. Uh, and that's, so it's pretty obvious that that surface is approximately flat, and you spend a lot of time on this in, uh, in SEDS. But the product of that, or the deposition on a low, dipping surface is the stratified sedimentary rock. And the stratification is the key marker that's used to reconstruct when you have sedimentary rocks, of course, that's the features that are used to distribute. Those are the bodies of rock that are generated by that process. So the stratified layers here in the Grand Canyon represent the sequence of the rocks that are used to produce geometry. Now here it's fairly straightforward because essentially most of them are still fairly flat line or only gently tilted. Uh, but the idea is basically there. You can see that they produce that conspicuous feature. Again, that's very straightforward. This is like physical geology, right? You're learning this. But it's important to keep in mind 
not remember the, not forget the basics. That gets summarized in this 16th or 17th century concept, right? You might remember this from physical. These sort of three concepts of Steno's principles of superposition, which is the layer cake of strata, original horizontality, which I just stated, is the rocks that are laid, laid down on the central horizontal surface, and principle of lateral continuity means that they have some distribution over some, that those strata are deposited of same kind of compositions over a larger region. Uh, each of those has characteristics that are important to keep, I, I only do that here, because each of those has characteristics that are important to use in the context of structural geology. Superposition, horizontality, and lateral continuity are important to keep in mind on the practicality of reducing certain kinds of geologic structure. But the primary thing about this is that they give rise to the primary Set architecture of rock bodies of sedimentary rocks is this stratified or layer cake geometry of the rock masses and are laid down as a, a sheet that are approximately horizontal. Now you'll have to unlearn horizontality and says that not everything is deposited on a flat surface, but for bonehead structural geologists, that's always our first assumption. Because what else are you going to do, right? You can't re, re find out what it is. You can make deductions, but you don't worry about that later. Uh, if you find anything else, they're not horizontal anymore. That alone tells you the rocks have had something happen to them, right? That's the simplest. Early geologists figured that one out, right? That if those strata are tilted, well, something happened, right? Uh, that's the most basic geologic evidence of, of deformation of the rock. Now, Stano's principles are really the key assumptions that we use in putting together or stitching together rock bodies to make geologic maps and the like. Uh, and so we are decided to send this person on the sequencing or superposition uh, is the equivalent of time sequence. In structure, we use a special term called spacing. Uh, or the, the direction of, of Younging is called facing. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. I'll, I'll say this over and over again. But Structural geologists are the only people that ask which way is up, right? Uh, and, and I'll get to the meeting in a moment. But continuity is another important issue, and it's really important in the context of using rocks for mapping geologic structure. Because lateral continuity allows us to, to look at bodies of rock that are over, can be correlated over a larger region. So here's a perfect example of, of a correlation of that site source with the continuity an inference of lateral continuity where these two buttes are obviously the same sedimentary unit in flat-lying rock. That's straightforward in flat-lying rock. It's not so straightforward when the rocks get chewed up by multiple structures and get faulted around and so forth. You have other ways that you have to deal with that. Uh, but that the, the localization of things like this, where you have bodies of rock that have distinctive compositions, is the basic concept behind what's formalized in what's called lithostratigraphy. In set strat, people hardly ever talk about this much anymore. I think Rick probably spends a day on it. I don't know how much he really spends on it, but not a lot. Uh, because of, because set strat people have a different attitude about lithostratigraphy versus, you know, they're all interested in how depositional systems work and they don't care about rock units. But lithostratigraphy is the building block of geologic maps. And it's important to remember that lithostratigraphy is a basic feature of all geology. It's been introduced to this, but the classic word rock formation is nothing more than that. It's a formalized unit or a description. Well, is, uh, what is, I forgot my own thing here. <laughs> well, it, rock formations are an example. They're just the formalization of the concept of, of rock units is the concept of lithostratigraphy. Uh, those, I'm not sure, that get myself all tangled up here. Can you see this in the back of the room or should I turn these lights off? Because I, maybe I do need those lights off now. Is that okay? Can you, let me, can I turn them up here? I can't remember. Mm -hmm. That one doesn't work. There we go. There you can see better. I should have turned mm -hmm. them off better. Uh, Lithostratigraphy is nothing more than a 
the formalization of description of bodies of rock in stratified rocks or any grouping of rocks where formal units are defined by breaks in rock composition or something that allows you to distinguish one rock unit versus another. So in the Grand Canyon, this is fairly straightforward, so you can see the Grand Canyon here on the on this sidebar. You can see this classic ledge sitting here on the edges of the Grand Canyon. Uh, that is a sandstone that lies on top of older rock units. So the base of there's the base of that sandstone is in contact with other rock units, and it's overlain by a shale. That rock unit is formalized by a rock name called the Petite Sandstone. So the base of the unit is the beginning of sandstone <coughs> on top of something else, and the top is some division between sandstone and shale, the overlying shale called the Bright Angel Shale. Uh, there are details about the formal definition of that particular rock unit. In the case of things like the Petite Sandstone, that the, the division between that rock unit and the under overlying rock unit is a simple boundary that's quite obvious to go from sandstone to shale. Not all rock units are that simple. In fact, many are much more complex. You can have rock units that have more complicated boundary relationships, but they're all formalized. So you can have sharp boundaries, you can have gradational boundaries, but there's always a division that's formalized. We'll go over this in field examples, but the point is this formalization is what allows us to make geologic maps. Because if you formalize the Petite Sandstone, it's always defined by the first sandstone and the last sandstone going up section, uh, then the next geologist can connect their map to your map, and the maps go together without having a map boundary fault. And we'll talk about why that is. And what I mean by that is geologist A follows this layer to this position, geologist B follows this layer to this position, and they don't map when they come together because they're following a different horizon. And that's why we use different, different or formalized rock units to avoid that. There's, if you, if you, in historically, you may have gone over this, the classic fight between two old British geologists mm -hmm. was basically related to that of following boundaries. This, in case, was mostly related to fossils, but they were following boundaries that they were calling the divisions between different rock units, in this case, geologic time units. And they didn't match, so they just fought about it instead of deciding, oh, we're going to do something else, right? Uh, but anyway, it's, it's, so it's formalized, not just to avoid fights, but to also allow maps to pile together so you can have geologic maps that come together on a regional scale. But those, those map units are the building blocks for, uh, for all geologic structural studies or geologic maps. Now, sedimentary rocks are the simplest type of features to deal with because they, Steno's principles were developed for sedimentary rocks, and sedimentary rocks typically faithfully obey Steno's principles reasonably well, right? In other words, superposition is obeyed. They are laid down in a layer cake. Uh, they are essentially merely flat lined. Uh, when they're de deposited, uh, and they have sedimentary environments spread over large regions, so they have large lateral continuity. How well do you think Steno's principles might apply to another groups of rocks, to other, to other groups of rocks, igneous rocks, for example, both extrusive and intrusive, or metamorphic rocks? Not very well. Or, well, where do they? Right? Probably the best answer here is depends on what you mean, right? Uh, and so let's we'll talk about that for just a second, so we're not doing that on that. Metamorphics are the easiest to deal with initially, but not in the long run. Uh, because they're derived from either igneous or sedimentary rock. Their initial geometry is inherited from a protoid. Uh, most geologists ignore the metamorphic rocks and just lump them together and don't worry about it too much. Uh, but in fact, we can deal with this a little bit later. 
so the answer on that one is kind of, and it depends on the scenario. Igneous rocks are a slightly more different problem. And let's start, let's, let's think about these for a second and think about how rock bodies generated by each of these processes are important in the context of primary geologic structure. So volcanic rocks, for example, are really a special class of sediment rock. Now, a sedimentologist would never claim that. In fact, there's this whole bastard group of rocks, right, yeah. that nobody wants to claim that are volcanic rocks, but they're deposited in sedimentary environments, right? Like volcanic classic rocks. Nobody likes them. Because they don't fit in igneous deposits, or they don't fit in sedge very well. So they just kind of get left behind, and nobody wants them. And they're ugly, too. <laughs> <laughs> but they're important because they're just they're deposited in sedimentary materials, right? Uh, and, and in fact, really, volcanic rocks really are just a special case of sedimentary rock. They're they just happen to be awfully hot when they get deposited on the surface of the earth. And they well, and they mark very specific periods of time, right? With the the ash that we can track that came out of major eruptions. And oh yeah, yeah. In fact, that's well. We'll get to that in a minute. There. They are extremely useful even in sedimentary rocks, but they're so variable, and that's what I'm going to get to in a second. Uh, but you, so you get asked, do they, uh, the Stenos principles apply? And think about that as we go along. The intrusive rocks are, even, are actually a bigger problem because they're placed on the subsurface. So by being in place on the subsurface, you have to ask yourself, what can we say about any initial shape? Of those rock bodies? Uh, and the answer is a little bit, but not necessarily a lot. It kind of just depends as we go on. So let's let's think about this for a minute. And I'll just kind of give you some thoughts on this. So for example, volcanic rocks, do they do they always obey superposition? What do you think? Yes? Who thinks they obey up superposition? No? No. Either way. How about horizontality? Yes? No? Mm -hmm. How about lateral continuity? Mm -hmm. I see yes. No, because right. they're Everybody's poking going, through, know, breaking through. And and right. <laughs> it depends. Some situations, yes, some no. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> exactly. Uh, superposition generally is yes, because they get laid down on the surface of the ground, too. But it turns out uh, you can get confused. I've been done that. <laughs> uh, how about silt, for example? Mm -hmm. A volcanic pile of silt is inserted into the volcanic pile. It's not superposition anymore. The sill is younger than the surrounding rock. And it produces all kinds of nasty. And you know, it's very hard to tell the sill from the surrounding volcanic rock. The like, same can happen mm -hmm. with diking and a whole bunch of other things. We'll see that in a minute. Horizontality, that's another one. Depends. And I'll say generally no, actually. And it comes about because there's different types of volcanoes. We're going to come to that in a second. And then also lateral continuity, sort of, because it depends on how, what you mean by lateral continuity is a scale issue. And because some things like giant ash falls can cover gigantic areas, World. other things are very localized. So let's just think about that for a minute. Here's a perfect example of the first place to think about it in the context of volcanic rocks. Here's a big stratovolcano in western Mexico. Uh, different parts of that volcanic system illustrate a lot of issues about original horizontality, right? Would you call that originally? Deposited on a horizontal surface? Nope. Mm -mm. On the other hand, the city, anybody ever been to the city of Colima in Mexico? Beautiful place. Uh, talk about a city that waits to die. <laughs> uh, the city is built on the toe of a gigantic ash flow that came out of that volcano. It blew up its old remnants of the ash. And it's, the city is built on this thing that's like 100 meters thick. Hmm. Uh, wouldn't 
would it be a good place to be? But <laughs> at any rate, there, out in the valley, those volcanic deposits were essentially deposited on the surface. Uh, and there were haars that come off this thing. They're also deposited on a semi-flat surface. So you get deposited on a, on a uh, riverbed or something of that particular sort. Or in this particular case, they also can go out to the sea. There are even deposits that are out in, in the ocean, which are essentially become marine sedimentary rocks. So that's why the answer is depends if you're at the site of the volcanic edifice in the proximal face of these volcanic rocks of a stratovolcano, then you better not clean that stuff for Obama. But if you're in distal deposits, it could be you know, just essentially interbedded with sedimentary rock. Uh, how about another type? This is Hawaii. Um, Mauna Loa in the background. So is that horizontal? Kind of in the foreground, but not in the background, right? Mm -hmm. So again, it kind of depends, right? Uh, the good news about these kind of volcanoes is this is basalt, right? It is true that usually on basalts, it's not so anus, you know, mm -hmm. close enough for government work, you know, maybe no more than 10 degrees, so <laughs> better than nothing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> They made that sort of at the 10 degrees, and that's sort of the maximum slope you might see on a, on a uh, basalt. So if you got something dipping 90 degrees, well, you know, it's rotated at least 80. Uh, but maybe it did 110, you don't know. But uh, at any rate, it's kind of plus or minus, but it's better than nothing. And, uh, and that's, so that's an important point. The other issue I forgot to mention, lateral continuity, I forgot to mention that on the volcano, uh, on the stratovolcano, there's another issue, right? The scale of the continuity of rock bodies is the scale of flows or pyroclastic flows or lahars that come off the volcanic edifice. So on the, in the case of, say, that big stratovolcano, the flows maybe extend 10 kilometers from the, at most. Not even that, actually. More like three or four kilometers from the volcanic center. Uh, so you wouldn't expect things to extend 100 kilometers, right? You can't correlate something that extended 100 kilometers from that site. But it might, but you might have a lahar that went that far. Not terribly likely, but you know, a long ways, right? Same's true with the, with the salt. You gotta think about the scale that the flow is going. So just think of the scale of Hawaii as sort of like the biggest distance you can think of flows going typically might be on a place like Hawaii a few tens of kilometers max uh, for the continuity of an individual flow. But they're all but they have funny shape. Their primary shape, if you're a flow, the primary shape of a flow is not a big sheet, right? It tends to be a channelized thing. So it's kind of like a river deposit or something. It might be long and skinny. So continuity is variable in different directions on volcanic rocks. They're flows. So it's kind of on a flat surface, but continuity is kind of in and out of there and stuff, yada, yada, right? You got to think about that. If you ever work in those kind of rocks, right, you got to remember to think about those scale concepts of how you think about the rock bodies, how they started out, how they ended up, and how continuity, how, how uh, continuous they are. So as a simple conclusion, uh, in volcanic rocks, we can't generally assume original horizontality within a, you know, a few tens of degrees, really. Uh, pyroclastics that are deposited on stratovolcanoes have initial dips of as much as 30 degrees or more. Uh, they can be a little more than that, but not a lot more than that. Basalts might have lower initial dips. Uh, uh, but they can also still erupt from distant topography as close as like 30 degrees. Some volcanic deposits, are flat lying, I mean, they're virtually, they are sediment. Distal tufts, the distal ash balls, are used routinely as markers, time markers, in fact, mm -hmm. in sedimentary deposits. So it's a scale issue of how far the material is dispersed and so forth. So there's a whole range of issues on volcanic rocks. You have to think what you're looking at before you make use of volcanic rocks and use them as a marker for understanding geologic structure. Lateral continuity is the same issue. It ranges from small scales, like 20 meter across flow, 
do something that's about dispersed for a continent wide in the case of ashes. So again, you've got to know what you're looking at to make use of these kinds of systems. And then finally, there's this cautionary note about superposition. The deck can get shuffled in, uh, in volcanic rocks. I gave the sill example. I'll give you my other example. My own, uh, my own bone had to move. I spent a whole day once mapping. Oh, yeah, this volcanic flow, 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 flow. Then walking across this ridge line, and I, I thought my steeply dipping volcanic flows, I got to the other end and realized there was nothing but dikes. <laughs> they were all in a dike swarm, and the reason they were steeply dipping is because they were dikes. <laughs> and, um, so there went that structure out the door. But they, they looked like layered rocks, and it could be very easy to get confused. So keep that in mind, too, intrusions in, and firewalled intrusions can look like volcanic rocks. Um, so sedimentary and volcanic rocks deposit on the Earth's surface and are laid down in a stratified body. Yeah, you can read this yourself. Uh, it's that layer ca characteristic, though, of whether they're volcanic rocks or sedimentary rocks that's key because you can use the lithologic boundaries between those primary rock bodies, whether they're bodies of strata or lithologic boundaries between an andesite and a basalt, or whatever it might be, or a pyroclastic flow deposit sitting with a rhyolite or dacite flow sitting on top of it. Those are all just contact relationships between rock units that we use to differentiate uh, geometry. We, in the case of sedimentary rocks, we can usually be pretty confident they start out flat lying in volcanic rocks. You have to use a little bit more flaky assumptions. But for all in all, it's, it's, that's a sedimentary rocks and certain volcanic rocks are the easiest to work with this way because we have this natural architecture that we can use to deduce the structure just from the basis of that, that architecture of those rock deposits. Uh, so okay, let's go on with a couple of other things. Uh, why is this important? If you, in, in any case, uh, these, these are the foundations of geologic mapping. That it, and this type of boundary, whether it's in volcanic rocks or in stratified sedimentary rocks, is given a special name. Uh, it's called a depositional contact between rock masses. So in a, in a stack of stratified rock, there are gazillions of depositional contacts. Any stratify, stratification is a depositional contact between rock mass A and rock mass B. We pick certain groups of depositional contacts or recognizable depositional contacts to, to define rock units. So if I see a sandstone shale boundary, but I can always see this pink sandstone goes to this green shale, I can always find that boundary. So that depositional contact becomes my map unit feature that I use. But there are infinite numbers of other depositional contacts in the stack, right? We just pick one to use out of convenience. But there's a, all the stratified rocks have these depositional contacts as part of them. Uh, on a, on a geologic map, depositional contacts between formal rock units are always shown as a thin black line uh, between two different, and then the rock units are labeled one way or, way or the other. That's the standard geologic map kind of idea. You've seen that before, but we'll go from there. So take, for example, this picture I showed, which you probably couldn't see before because I have a lot. Yes, ma'am. Ah, a volcanoclastic rock is a volcanic rock made of volcanic clasts of that, uh, or mostly of volcanic clasts. So, uh, clastic, clast, or clastic just means broken, right? So, volcanoclastic just means volcanic broken. And so, a rock that's comprised of, of volcanic clasts is a volcanic clastic rock. We'll talk about cataclastic rocks here, 
which are deep, broken rocks, which are fault rocks. Um, so that you, that word is used all the time in geology, which is hiding broken. So you use a fancy word for broken. But yeah, volcanic elastic rocks, if you ever look at volcanic elastic rocks, they really are ugly. Uh, and uh, so there's a reason people don't like them. And there's <laughs> <laughs> you know, a bunch of fine grain and junk and sitting in mud and all kinds of, yeah, but they can be fun, actually. Yeah. In the field, they're more fun than hand specimens. You've probably been introduced to them more in hand specimens. They're really ugly in hand specimens. Sometimes they have cool feathers in the field. But anyway. <laughs> uh, all right, Grand Canyon. We talked about this before. You can see this, there are various things here. Before I go on, remember, you just think about this, right? Rock units have a formation, are, are con, units of convenience, right? So when somebody, they're always made up by somebody in the past, or for, unless you have to be someplace where the stratigraphy has never been established. Traditionally, somebody goes through and finds a beautifully exposed section of sedimentary strata, and they pick boundaries within those strata that are easy to trace across an area. So here's a good example. You can see a color change here from reddish to dark. And those dark rocks go from here from dark to lighter color, right? That would be a very easy thing to see. There's also this contact we'll come back to. We did this one before, right? Ledgy rocks versus slope formers. Those are all kinds of things that can be used, right? All of those are just the kind of things that are used to formalize stratigraphic units, right? So you draw, there are various boundaries that can be drawn in those strata. Which here's the one that's the boundary between the dark rocks and the pinkish rocks. Here's one up in here that shows the base of this cliff former, called the Red Wall Limestone. And there's another one up here that's the base of the sandstone here, right? Uh, and those are all formalized. If you're standing there with a topographic map in hand, you might be able to draw those lines in yourself, right? Uh, because those are easily seen even on a, on a photograph and things like that. You'd like to have an orthophotograph. We'll come to map basing in a minute. But that's a beautiful example. Those are all depositional contacts. Because, and the important thing about depositional contacts, I think we just thought I'd move on, is all the strata and that are parallel to the contact. So even though the depositional contact itself is here, the surrounding enveloping strata have the same depositional contact that are parallel to it. There are an infinite number of lines, or not infinite, but a very large number of lines that you can imagine to follow that because of the lay, just like the leaves of a book. Uh, and that's a key feature of that. So on a geologic map, here's a classic geologic map of the Grand Canyon. You see those formal stratigraphic units here in the upper part of the, you can't see this in the back, but those are topographic contours. So these are flat line strata. So the rock units follow the topographic contours just like they should. Uh, and you can see those formal rock units. So here's that sandstone unit, the Cameron sandstone unit with the peak, the bright angle shale. There's a Cameron carbonate unit, a cliff forming. Mississippian carbonate unit called the Red Wall and so forth, up with things like Ben Ridge and those, some of those rock units. But they're just formal stratified units that comprise that, that, that unit. Uh, I already said this. There's nothing profound about these contacts. They're just convenient, right? Uh, they're totally arbitrary, and they're just chosen so that geologist A can connect map to the geologist B. And one of the things that comes up commonly is that the definitions of rock units in one area might not be sufficient over time. So people may redefine the stratigraphic units with finer subdivisions if they want to see more, very, more details than the bigger units, they might have to divide the rock units into subdivisions. So the bigger formations might become a group of formations. And it's all just arbitrary. It's all done on ad hoc or done out of convenience. When you take the field class this winter, we'll see good examples of that, where the formal formations in the Death Valley area are just too big to be useful for modern geologic mapping. They were defined 50 years ago when they had lousy map bases. And the rock units are a kilometer thick. And so you know, hmm. we 
do with a kilometer thick rock you need, right? Uh, so it's moderately easy to divide, so you divide them in pieces so you can get this. So anyway, that's my way to do this. Uh, I said delegates are the only people that ask which way is, is up. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, in stratified rock, whether it's sedimentary or volcanic in it, superposition is very, very important because the Younging direction is tremendously important to understand the larger scale structure. If you don't know which way is the original stratigraphic up in sections, you're kind of screwed, actually. Uh, you know the stratification, but you don't know. It's very hard to deduce the larger structure. We'll see that as we go along. Uh, a lot of this has to do with folding, right? Take rocks and fold them. The extreme example is to take strata and fold them so that they're essentially parallel to each other. Then it becomes tremendously important to know when you flip, when you've taken those things and they flip so that the young strata are going this way and this way and so forth. Uh, so that's why we use, in structure, we always use this term. We use a term called facing. A rock's face, this will be your first term, you'll get stuck with here, rock's face in the direction of younging. So the way to remember that is if you're laying on the rock, you're looking up in the direction of younging, you're facing the direction of younging. Uh, how is this determined? Anybody have a clue? A lot of different ways, it turns out. 